<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I'd appreciate your indulgence. I, uh, I've got some things that I'd like to get off my chest about, uh, about our great Federation uh, of Canada. I should probably, when this is done, be paying all of you for a little bit of therapy, but I have some, some things to offer and maybe, maybe it will uh, cause us to have a, a broader discussion at our tables and beyond this evening. I want to talk tonight about the West, its history in confederation, and the continued disparity between the region's economic power as it exists today and the political influence we have in our confederation. I want to offer some thoughts on what strategies we might employ to address the disparity. But in order to understand where we are today, we should have another just brief look back at where we have come as a region within the, context, within the Canadian context. Central to that story is one of the most fascinating yet virtually unknown actors in Canadian history. He's buried not far from here. His name is Sir Frederick Haltane. Academics call him the forgotten father of Confederation. In the year 1900, Haltane drafted a bill to create the new province of Buffalo, which would be made up of present-day Saskatchewan and Alberta together, coming into Confederation as one. Two years later, the Laurier government rejected that notion. In the dry understatement of writer Derek Hayes, quote, Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier concerned that so much Western power would overwhelm central Canada, opted for two equal-sized provinces divided at 110 degrees west. And so the pattern begins. A pattern that has led some rational people living in the West to mount a reasonable case that the economic and political interests of this region have and always will be, and, and here's where I think we make mistakes sometimes if we subscribe to this, but always will be subordinated to the larger interests of other important parts of our country, other important regions of our country. Some might argue this is simply a matter of numbers. As you say in one of your recent foundation reports, unlike the 13 million people in Ontario, uh, 10 uh, million Westerners are dispersed among four separate provinces. Others would say it's not just numbers, but it's an inherent bias. It's routine subordination of our interest written right into the DNA of the BNA and what would follow from that. Some would say, perhaps quite correctly, it's just simply a product of what is a de facto unicameral government in our country. Really one effective house that is exclusively representation by population. And so therefore, quite fairly many would argue, there is going to be that disproportionate influence for those areas of, of greater population. Whatever theory Westerners may subscribe to, if any at all, you can point to some early manifestations of that bias in, for example, the national policy of John A. Macdonald, a policy designed to be a catalyst to development of a robust manufacturing base in Eastern Canada, but a policy whose effect at the same time was a West stifled through high tariffs designed to artificially shore up that infant manufacturing base. Remember the words of, of the greatest Canadian in my view, and not the one that was voted recently on CBC, uh, John A. Macdonald, who, you know, obviously I may have some differences with, res with respect to his perception of the West as it was over 100 years ago, but consider what he said. He said, the opening of the prairie lands, this is March 27, 1865, the opening of the prairie lands would drain away our youth and strength, our youth and strength meaning Central Canada. I am perfectly willing personally to leave the whole country wilderness for the next half century, but I fear if the English do not go in, the Yankees will. And so there are early manifestations of this. Some would say, it, you're not really paranoid if everyone really is out to get you. <laughs> there are other examples. Less or more egregious, perhaps, depending who you talk to. Current examples, perhaps. The National Energy Program is one of them, and it is still talked about here, and it is talked about still in the great province of Alberta. 
And there are different assessments of the cost and the toll of the National Energy Program on what was an infant industry in our province and a developed industry uh, in Alberta, but certainly a cost nonetheless. There are more recent examples in the public, public discourse of our nation, including a recent federal energy critic who on nationally syndicated radio programs refused to rule out nationalizing the oil sands on behalf of his party. Some would say, well, really, that was just one member talking about nationalizing the oil sands, not seriously the, the policy of, of, the, of, the, of the party that was contesting for national leadership. Maybe. But you know, you are met tonight in a great city, in a great province, where an industry was nationalized, the potash industry, in the 1970s, not long ago, in the 1970s. And so for the rest of the country, they would perhaps forgive us if we hear those words, maybe on a talk show, maybe just by some independent-minded MP of a party, and we would at least be a little bit worried. We'd at least have a few questions about the origins of that sentiment. There have been national leaders of political parties in the last four years who have said, who have told young people not to pursue, quote, the easy money of the oil industry. My brother worked for Halliburton in Medicine Hat, Alberta, Canada for a long time. And uh, I mean, he was able to raise his family. Uh, but if you talk to him today, he's not in the industry anymore, but if you talk to him today, there was nothing easy about the money that he made and he heard that comment, though he w he's no longer in the industry, and he was kind of offended by that comment and, uh, and questioned the disconnect, the, the lack of understanding between fellow citizens in the same country. More recently, there has been a report that has been commissioned by a chartered bank and executed by the uh, Pembina Institute in conjunction with the David Suzuki Foundation. It an analyzed the economic costs, and this room will know it well, of meeting Canada's greenhouse reduction goals. And so once again, we read headlines about how the West will have to write most of the checks to cover the $8 billion cost of a proposed cap and trade scheme. Depending on which climate change rules are adopted, the new study concludes Saskatchewan's economy would lose anywhere between 2.5 and 7.5% of its GDP. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's important for us to engage in this debate and in other debates that impact on this region. Engage in those debates as proud Canadians, Canadians that understand, as has been already said tonight by John, that a strong Saskatchewan and a strong West means a strong Canada. Engage in a dialogue that at its, at its core posits that you don't have to necessarily trade off environmentally sustainable energy and resource development with policies that could bludgeon the parts of the economy of this country that are working reasonably well today and that will lead us out of the malaise of the current international recession. So, there may be an ever-increasing measure, certainly, of Western prosperity that is becoming known to more and more people on the continent and in, the, in, in other parts of, of our country. The disconnect between this region's economic might and the measure of national political power and influence also is growing. There is a sense that the political influence of our region is not necessarily keeping pace with the economic influence that we have in our country. And the locus of economic power and influence has slowly but inexorably been shifting west for the past 25 years. The locus of political power, however, and influence remains stubbornly fixed in that Bermuda Triangle, Toronto, Ottawa, and, and maybe Quebec City is the other point in that triangle. Given this apparently immutable reality, what is the likelihood for change? What is the source of hope that we would have uh, in this room then, that 